Armando Sudangan, Biology and Medicine videos, please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group for the latest videos, please visit Facebook Armando Hasudangan. In this video, we're going to look at the motor pathways. If you have not watched the video on the introduction to the descending and ascending tracts, please watch that beforehand. There is also a sensory motor pathway video if you are interested. So in the brain, there are two important cortexes, one in front of the, uh, the, the central gyrus, known as the motor cortex, and the other at the back, which is um, the somatosensory cortex. Now, these two cortexes are important. One controls motor movements and the other sensation. We will be focusing on the motor cortex. So let us take a cross section of the motor cortex um, here. So here is the motor, uh, the cortex of the brain. It is made up of the outer gray matter where synapses are. And then there's the inner white matter, which contains uh, myelinated axons. On each side of the cortex, right and left, there are areas that represent a particular region in our body. So here I am drawing uh, on the left side and we can see um, here we have represe uh, represented particular areas of the body, such as the hands, the face, the legs. Um, and these areas, these regions, make up the motor cortex. And essentially, signals will arise from one of these areas, which will then uh, travel t to that particular area of the body to perform that uh, movement or action. So I hope that made sense. And if it doesn't, we'll look at some examples soon enough. And of course, in the, in the cortex itself, there's a region called the thalamus, which is the relay station. And this is quite important to know. So the motor pathways can be divided into two main pathways. The, the lateral pathway and the anterior medial pathway. We will first focus on the lateral pathway, which is responsible for voluntary movements. So we control these movements. And there are three main tracts involved in uh, the lateral pathway. And these are the lateral corticospinal tract, which control distal muscles, such as our forearm. There is also the anterior corticospinal tract, which control the proximal muscles. So it would be the arm, for example. The anterior corticospinal tract I highlighted here because it is voluntary, but not part of the lateral pathway itself. Um, regardless, the lateral and anterior corticospinal tracts are very important in voluntary muscle control. The third tract that we will talk about is the rubrospinal tract. Before looking at these tracts, let us learn some other important structures involved. So here I am drawing the midbrain. Below the midbrain is the pons, which I have not drawn. Then we have the medulla here. And here is a section of a spinal cord. Let us just say it's a cervical uh, segment of the spinal cord. And here is a skeletal muscle for, uh, for movement of the arm or forearm, for, for example. Now, within, within sections of the spinal cord, like within the spinal cord, there are uh, designated tracts. For example, there are designated tracts for uh, the ones I mentioned earlier. So here we have a tract for the lateral corticospinal uh, pathway, the anterior corticospinal pathway, and then the rubrospinal tract is here. And there are many other tracts, which we will look at later in this video. Let us first focus on the corticospinal tracts. So let us say we want to move our hands, so distal muscle. So a neuron will arise from the motor cortex, which control hand movements, here. It will pass through the thalamus, pass through the uh, cerebri of the midbrain and the pyramids of the medulla, where it will then cross over and land on the lateral corticospinal tract before synapsing with a second neuron on the ventral horn of the spinal cord. The first neuron coming down is therefore part of the lateral corticospinal pathway. The second neuron coming from the ventral horn of the spinal cord will then target the skeletal muscle which 
has to be the distal muscle. So for example, muscles of the hands. The second neuron is known as the lower uh, motor neuron. And the first neuron arising from the cortex is the upper motor neuron. Of course, if this neuron was part of the anterior corticospinal tract, I would, uh, it would pass through the anterior corticospinal tract here uh, before synapsing with the lower motor neuron. Okay, so we know about the lateral and anterior corticospinal tract. Now let us learn about the rubrospinal tract. The rubrospinal tract is for voluntary control of big muscles. Um, it's basically, it's, it is important. There is an area in the midbrain uh, known as the red nucleus where the rubrospinal pathway begins. It essentially descends down and crosses over passing the pons, the medulla, before landing on the rubrospinal tract on the, uh, of the spinal cord and then synapsing with the lower motor neuron. With a corticospinal lesion, there can be paralysis on the contralateral side, the opposite side. The function of the muscle can be uh, recovered by the rubrospinal tract if the rubrospinal tract is intact. Now, it is important to understand that the left side of the brain controls movements of the right side of the body and vice versa. So if we damage the the left side of the brain corticospinal pathway, there will be paralysis on the right side, on the opposite side. And this is known as the contralateral side. So I hope you understood the, the lateral pathways, which are made up of the lateral corticospinal tract and the uh, rubrospinal tract, but we also added onto this uh, section the anterior corticospinal tract because it is voluntary control. But now let's just recap the descending motor tracts that we've learned where, where, where it's located and some of the new ones. So here is a spinal cord section and here I'm drawing, uh, I'm coloring in yellow the descending motor tract, which we have learned so far are the lateral motor pathways, which are part of our voluntary control. Uh, these are the lateral corticospinal tract, and here is the rubrospinal tract. And here in the front, the anterior, uh, the ventral side, is the anterior corticospinal tract. Some new tracts which we will now investigate um, are the tectospinal, vestibulospinal, and reticulospinal tracts. Let us look at these tracts and briefly look at their functions. We won't, however, go into too much detail. All these tracts are part of the anterior medial pathway. These pathways control axial muscles, such as you know the, the spine muscles and the rib muscles, and these uh, which are responsible for posture and balance, and the coarse control of axial and proximal muscles. Note the proximal muscles. So the anterior medial pathway include the vestibulospinal tract, which, uh, which, are, which also include the medial and lateral vestibulospinal tracts. There is also the reticulospinal tracts, which include the pontine and medullary tracts. And there is also the tectospinal tract. And part of this uh, category is the anterior corticospinal tract, which we already talked about and which is voluntary and controls proximal muscles. And so I highlighted it. So basically, the anterior, uh, the anterior medial pathway um, mainly controls the axial muscles for posture and balance, except for the anterior corticospinal tract, which is voluntary control of proximal muscles, remember. Again, here we are drawing some important structures, the brain, the cortex, the thalamus, and the motor cortex here. We have the midbrain, pons, which I've not drawn, the medulla, and there is the cerebellum here, which is important, and it actually connects, interconnects with all these motor pathways, and is responsible for coordination, essentially, as well as posture and balance.
Then of course we have the spinal cord and here are some skeletal muscles which we will target. On the spinal cord level we can find the tracts. Here is the tectospinal tract and the medullary reticulospinal tract. We will first focus on the vestibulospinal pathway which originates from the medulla's vestibular nucleus. It descends down and synapses with a second neuron in the spinal cord, but we won't look at that. Just know that the vestibulospinal tract is responsible for head, maintaining head balance and turning. Now, the reticulospinal tract can either originate from the medulla or the pons. So it can be medullary or pontine. Here I am drawing the reticulospinal tract which originates from the medulla, an area known as the medullary, uh, the medullary uh, reticular formation. It travels down this neuron that arises from here and lands on the medullary reticulospinal tract before it synapses with a second order neuron on the ventral horn and then targets an axial muscle uh, responsible for posture and balance. If the reticulospinal tract is damaged, a harmless stimulus can elicit a flexor reflex. Um, the last tract we will look at is the tectospinal tract, which originates from the midbrain here, the area known as the uh, superior col col colliculus. The tectospinal pathway descends down and then crosses over, descends again and lands on the tectospinal tract before synapsing with a second neuron, which will target an axial muscle. Now the tectospinal tract is responsible in the orientation uh, response. So orientating yourself in the world, essentially. So I hope that made sense. Um, so the motor pathways, again, can be divided into the lateral pathways or the anterior medial pathway. The corticospinal tract is probably the most important because it's voluntary control anyway. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.